Hello, I am Professor Saurabh Datta and I will be discussing about neonatal sepsis. It is important to talk about neonatal sepsis as it is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the neonatal period. The learning objectives of this presentation are as follows. The definition of neonatal sepsis, the magnitude of the problem of neonatal sepsis globally and in India, the various types of sepsis, the risk factors of neonatal sepsis, the clinical diagnosis, the common laboratory tests used for diagnosis, antibiotic therapy, supportive care, and adjunct therapies. I will not cover the prevention of sepsis as that is a huge topic by itself and will be covered elsewhere. I will also not cover the management of superficial infections and fungal sepsis. How is neonatal sepsis defined? Neonatal sepsis may be definite, probable or possible. Definite sepsis is defined as a clinical syndrome of a constellation of signs that are known to be associated with sepsis along with the growth of bacteria from one or more sterile body sites. Probable sepsis is defined as a similar clinical syndrome suggestive of sepsis but with sterile body fluid cultures. Often, probable sepsis is supported by positive test results of inflammatory biomarkers, CSF or urine analysis, or a chest x-ray suggestive of pneumonia. Possible sepsis is the presence of clinical features suggestive of sepsis or risk factors of early onset sepsis, but which are not supported by laboratory tests or cultures. The magnitude of the problem of neonatal sepsis is huge. It is far more in low and middle income countries compared to high income countries. This graph from a systematic review of data from 194 countries shows that overall 15% of all neonatal deaths can be attributed to sepsis. In the first week of life, sepsis accounts for 8% of all neonatal deaths. This is because Competing causes such as various intrapartum events and prematurity account for a larger absolute number of deaths. After the first week, however, sepsis is the dominant cause of neonatal mortality, accounting for as many as 37% of all deaths. Continuing with the discussion on the magnitude of the problem, in another global systematic review of population-based studies on clinical sepsis, it is found that the incidence in India varies anywhere between 5 to 170 per 1,000 live births, depending upon the setting. In hospital settings, the average incidence of culture positive sepsis is 16 per 1,000 live births, and approximately one third of these infants with culture positive sepsis die. In a recent large community based study in India, 4 out of every 1,000 live-born infants had culture-positive sepsis. In a hospital setting in India, 9% of cases of suspected sepsis had proven meningitis. Unfortunately, several studies have reported very high rates of multi-drug resistant sepsis, particularly so in hospital settings in India. Multi-drug resistance, including carbapenem resistance, has been especially associated with Acinetobacter baumannii sepsis. Neonatal sepsis may also be classified based upon the time of onset of clinical signs or based upon organ localization. Conventionally, neonatal sepsis is divided into early onset sepsis, which starts at less than 72 hours of life, and late onset sepsis, which starts at or beyond 72 hours of life. In High income countries, early onset sepsis and late onset sepsis are distinct entities. In these countries, early onset sepsis is primarily due to vertical transmission from the mother and is associated with maternal risk factors of sepsis, whereas late onset sepsis is not. The organisms causing early onset sepsis in high income countries are primarily group B streptococcus and E. coli, whereas those causing late onset sepsis are primarily Staphylococcus epidermidis. However, in South Asia, the distinction between early and late onset sepsis is blurred. 
most cases of early onset sepsis are also horizontally acquired from the hospital environment. The organisms causing early onset sepsis are similar to the ones causing late onset sepsis as can be seen in this graph. The orange bars represent early onset sepsis whereas the gray bars represent late onset sepsis. The three most common organisms are Klebsiella pneumoniae, E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus and they are equally prevalent amongst early and late onset sepsis. When we classify sepsis based upon organ localization, the commonest form of sepsis is septicemia, in other words, a bloodstream infection. Organ localization may manifest itself as pneumonia, meningitis, urinary tract infections and bone and joint infections. Moving on to the risk factors of sepsis. There are several risk factors known to be associated with neonatal sepsis. In a review published by Shane in 2013, several maternal and neonatal risk factors were enumerated. The maternal risk factors are exclusively associated with early onset sepsis, whereas the neonatal risk factors could be associated both with early onset and late onset sepsis. The maternal risk factors include prolonged rupture of membranes for more than 18 hours, prolonged labor for more than 24 hours, multiple or unclean pervaginal examinations, chorioamnionitis, maternal antibiotics received within seven days of delivery, and meconium-stained lica. The neonatal risk factors include prematurity and low birth weight, need for resuscitation, need for CPAP or IMV respiratory support, need for intravenous fluids, arterial lines, and being an outborn infant. Two large studies have shed light upon the risk factors of neonatal sepsis in India. One was a meta-analysis on Indian studies published in 2019. The risk factors of sepsis identified were the need for mechanical ventilation, outborn admission, male gender, prematurity, and premature rupture of membranes. In a secondary analysis of the data from the multicentric Delhi-based Dennis study, the independent risk factors of early onset sepsis were low birth weight, inadequate antenatal care, vaginal delivery, meconium stain lica, CPAP or IMV ventilation, and the presence of an arterial or intravenous cannula. As you can see from the previous two slides, there is a lot of overlap of the risk factors reported from various studies. The clinical signs of neonatal sepsis are protein. There is no unique sign or combination of signs for neonatal sepsis and they overlap with a common differential diagnosis of sepsis such as viral infections, perinatal asphyxia, hypoglycemia, inborn errors of metabolism and so on. Based on a large multi-country study, the WHO came up with a list of seven cardinal signs of neonatal sepsis, but these are for use in a community setting. They are not feeding well, convulsions, tachypnea, severe chest indrawing, fever more than 38 degrees centigrade, hypothermia less than 35.5 degrees centigrade, decreased movement or no movements at all. Neonatal sepsis may present with a large variety of clinical signs in hospital settings. These signs could be present in virtually any organ system. The signs could be systemic, hematological, cardiovascular, respiratory, nervous system related, gastrointestinal, renal or dermatological. I will not list out all possible signs on this slide as even this is not a complete list and the total list is exhaustive. There are certain clinical signs that give a clue regarding organ localization. For example, the presence of tachypnea, retractions, grunt and cyanosis suggests pneumonia. For patients who are already on respiratory support, an increase in ventilator requirements, increased secretions and the appearance of purulent secretions are clues indicating ventilator-associated pneumonia. Meningitis is an important and common complication of sepsis 
But unfortunately, most cases of meningitis present with the non-specific signs of sepsis. Rarely, the presence of seizures, bulging fontanelle, and coma may point towards the presence of meningitis. Similarly, urinary tract infections also present mostly with non-specific signs. Difficulty during maturation is unreliable in newborn infants as most normal newborn infants also cry during maturation. Unexplained poor weight gain, prolonged jaundice, fever and vomiting are subtle clues for UTI. UTI often occurs in the setting of bladder catheterization or urinary tract malformations. Bone and joint infections must be carefully looked for as they may be easily missed. The presence of local signs of inflammation, inability to move a limb because of pain combined with fever, suggests a bone or joint infection. We now move on to the laboratory diagnosis of neonatal sepsis. Laboratory tests must be performed when there is diagnostic uncertainty. The commonly available laboratory tests are CRP, hematological parameters such as total leukocyte count, absolute neutrophil count, immature to total ratio of neutrophils, procalcitonin, blood culture, cerebrospinal fluid analysis, urine analysis, and chest x-ray. C-reactive protein starts rising at 6 to 12 hours after the onset of infection and peaks at 2 to 3 days. C-reactive protein performs better as a diagnostic test in the setting of late onset sepsis than early onset sepsis. It has a very poor positive predictive value in early onset sepsis. Therefore, the decision to give antibiotics in the first few days of life must not be guided by a positive CRP. In late onset sepsis, the positive predictive value of CRP is better than in early onset sepsis, but is still at best modest. It has been shown that performing serial CRPs 12 to 24 hours apart is better than relying upon a single CRP. Serial negative CRPs incre increase the negative predictive value of the test. That means if two or three CRPs are negative, it is much better able to rule out sepsis. In a large meta-analysis on neonates with late onset sepsis published recently, the median sensitivity and specificity of CRP were actually disappointing and which has been mentioned on this slide. Although hematological parameters have been widely used, their ability to distinguish sepsis from no sepsis is very poor. Even when hematological parameters are combined with CRP in a sepsis screen, it does not substantially improve the performance of CRP. The ability of a positive screen to predict sepsis remains very low. So remember this very important take home point. A negative CRP and a negative sepsis screen can be used to rule out sepsis. However, a positive sepsis screen is not reliable for ruling in sepsis. 10 milligrams per liter is a commonly used cutoff value for CRP. However, it has been seen that many healthy term neonates may exceed this value, especially in the first few days of life. Interpreting cutoff values of hematological parameters is quite problematic because the ranges of normal values vary widely depending upon gestation and postnatal age. Therefore, it would be unwise to use a single cutoff value at all gestational ages and postnatal ages. It is better to refer to nomograms to determine the cutoff values. Several updated nomograms have been published in the last 15 years, including those by Schmutz et al. and Christensen et al. These give more reliable information compared to the Mandros and Mozinos charts, which were used earlier. Procalcitonin rises from 4 to 6 hours from the onset of sepsis and peaks at 24 hours. Procalcitonin performs better than CRP for bacterial sepsis. In a meta-analysis, its pooled sensitivity was 90% and specificity 88%. In head-to-head -head comparisons with CRP, 
It has been found that procalcitonin has a higher sensitivity and specificity than CRP, both in cord blood as well as for late onset sepsis. If both CRP and procalcitonin are performed, their results can actually be combined. The combination has been found to have better sensitivity and specificity than either CRP or procalcitonin alone. The commonly used cutoff of procalcitonin beyond 96 hours is 0.5 nanograms per ml. In the first few days of life, there is a huge physiological surge in the value of procalcitonin after which it stabilizes. To interpret procalcitonin values in the first 96 hours is difficult and one requires age-specific nomograms. As we all know, blood culture is the reference standard for neonatal sepsis. To get accurate blood culture results, one must draw the blood sample with full aseptic precautions and inoculate a minimum of 1 ml in a pediatric blood culture bottle. Most gram-negative organisms grow within 24 hours in an automated blood culture system such as Bactec and gram-positive organisms take longer to grow. The blood culture may occasionally be false negative or false positive. Common causes of false negative cultures are in inadequate sample, prior exposure to antibiotics and keeping the blood culture bottle in the refrigerator. The commonest cause of false positives is contamination at the time of drawing the sample or in the laboratory. Asymptomatic bacteremia is an uncommon cause of false positive cultures in the neonatal period. CSF culture is the gold standard for diagnosing neonatal meningitis, but the yield of CSF culture is poor in most centers. Often, lumbar punctures are deferred until the baby is more stable, which is why the prior exposure to antibiotics renders the CSF culture falsely negative. Commonly used rapid diagnostic tests are CSF leukocyte count, glucose and protein, whose cutoff values are mentioned here. In a recently performed diagnostic meta-analysis, none of the CSF tests had an ideal performance. However, increased WBC count had a substantially higher pooled sensitivity and area under the hierarchical ROC curve compared to the other two tests. All three tests had similar pooled specificity, which was around 87 to 89%. To diagnose urinary tract infections, the urine must have more than 10 white blood cells per microliter in uncentrifuged urine. Urine culture is the gold standard for diagnosis and the urine sample for culture must be collected either by an ultrasound guided suprapubic tap or by a fresh sterile single catheterization. Samples taken from test tubes, diapers or urine bags are not acceptable as there is a high risk of contamination. We now move on to antibiotic therapy of neonatal sepsis. Each unit must have its own empiric antibiotic policy. The choice of empiric antibiotics must be based upon the local data regarding etiologic organisms and their antibiotic sensitivity profiles. While generating an antibiotic policy, one must try to avoid third generation cephalosporins unless there is meningitis and try to combine antibiotics with known synergism. As a rule of thumb, the first line empiric combination must be able to cover at least 60 to 70 percent of etiologic organisms in the unit and the second line at least 80 to 90 percent. To generate an empiric antibiotic policy, one must collect data regarding etiologic bacteria and their sensitivity for the last 6 to 12 months. Then one must tabulate the frequency of various organisms and their sensitivity patterns and one must determine sensitivity to various antibiotic combinations and choose the best combination accordingly. For units without access to local antibiotic data and where resistance to common antibiotics is likely to be less, for example in primary or secondary care units, a reasonable choice for treating pneumonia or septicemia is a combination of either ampicillin or cloxicillin with either gentamicin or amikacin. For units without access to local antibiotic data and where 
resistance is likely to be common, one can empirically start with a combination of either piperacillin, tazobactam and amikacin or a combination of ciprofloxacin and amikacin if there is no other suitable option for first line antibiotics. In such units, the second line antibiotic is often meropenem and vancomycin may be added if MRSA is suspected. Once the culture is reported positive and the sensitivity report is available, one must re-evaluate to see whether the anti empiric antibiotic combination needs to be changed. If the report shows resistance to the empiric combination and the neonate has not shown satisfactory improvement, one must upgrade to the simplest and narrowest spectrum sensitive antibiotic available. Now, if the neonate shows unambiguous clinical improvement, it could be a case of in vivo sensitivity and one may cautiously continue with an empiric antibiotic combination which has in vitro resistance while monitoring the infant aggressively. To be on the safe side, however, it is advisable to avoid antibiotics with in vitro resistance if one is dealing with CNS or other deep-seated infections. If the sensitivity report shows sensitivity to simpler antibiotics, it is extremely important to de-escalate to the narrowest spectrum sensitive antibiotics. This must be done even if the patient was clinically improving on the empiric antibiotic combination. If the organism was sensitive to the empiric combination, the duration of the empiric antibiotic therapy must be included when calculating the total duration of antibiotics. In case antibiotics were started for suspected sepsis, but the subsequent clinical course, chest x-ray and biomarkers were not suggestive of sepsis, the antibiotics can be stopped as soon as the blood culture is reported sterile. If the neonate has culture negative probable sepsis, antibiotics may be given for 5 to 7 days. Culture positive sepsis with no meningitis is conventionally treated for 14 days. Neonates with uncomplicated meningitis are treated for 21 days. Ventriculitis, bone and joint infections and deep-seated abscesses are treated with antibiotics for four to six weeks. Now, it's very important to remember that these duration of antibiotics for various conditions are not based on reliable evidence and they have entered clinical practice without being adequately tested in randomized controlled trials. So these are just conventions. Moving on to supportive care. Supportive care plays an extremely important role in the management of sick septic neonates. Much of the mortality in the first 24 to 48 hours of sepsis can be prevented by meticulous attention to supportive care. Antibiotic levels may take some time to build up in the blood and body tissues. Moreover, the sudden lysis of bacteria by antibiotics may result in the release of cytokines which requires supportive care for management. The mainstay of supportive care is the maintenance of temperature, airway, breathing and circulation. Glucose and electrolyte disturbances are common, so these need to be carefully managed. Renal injury is managed by careful attention to fluid balance, modifying drug doses and performing dialysis if indicated. Anemia and bleeding must be treated with blood products. Anticonvulsants must be administered in case of seizures. The rigorous monitoring of vital sign parameters, fluid balance and perfusion are of utmost importance as a part of supportive care. Now a word about adjunct therapies. A variety of adjunctive therapies have been tried out, but none have been found to be successful. There is evidence to show that intravenous immunoglobulins and colony stimulating factors are not effective. There are small trials that offer hope for the use of double volume exchange transfusions, pentoxifalin, zinc and melatonin in the adjunctive treatment of sepsis. However, the total information size is rather limited for these interventions and they cannot be recommended as a standard of care. They must be evaluated in the setting of randomized controlled trials. Finally, to conclude, here are the take-home messages from this presentation. Sepsis 
is a syndrome of clinical science that are known to be associated with sepsis with or without a positive blood culture. Early and late onset sepsis are distinct entities in high income countries, but the distinction is blurred in South Asia. The clinical signs of sepsis are non-specific. CRP and procalcitonin are better able to rule out sepsis rather than rule in sepsis and both are slightly better for late onset than early onset sepsis. Between the two, procalcitonin is somewhat better than CRP. Empiric antibiotic policies must be drawn up by each unit based on their own local data. Once the culture and sensitivity report is available, every effort must be made to de-escalate the antibiotics. Typically, 5 to 7 days of antibiotics are used for probable sepsis, 14 days for culture-proven sepsis, and 21 days for treating meningitis. Supportive care plays a crucial role in management, and unfortunately, none of the experimental adjunctive therapies are yet approved for routine clinical use. With that, we come to an end of this presentation on neonatal sepsis. I hope you have found it useful and that it will help you in your clinical practice. Thank you very much for listening.